I'm going to give you a little bit of geography, some history, and I hope not too much Persian poetry. <laughs> uh, there's a handout that's going around, making the rounds, so I hope you have it. If you don't, raise your hand and Peter will get to you. Uh, I would like to begin with a, the birth of Persian poetry. And I need this to point to it in... Ah, oh, here we go. Uh, if you look at this Central Asian region, and if you see the city of Samarkand, and then there's Bukhara underneath it, and then there's Herat, that's where Persian poetry begins essentially in the 9th and 10th centuries. Uh, now, Marshall Hodgson wrote a book on uh, ventures of Islam in which he makes this statement. The rise of Persian had more than purely literary consequences. It served to carry a new overall cultural orientation within Islam down. Most of the more local languages of high culture that later emerged among Muslims depended on Persian wholly or in part for the prime literary inspiration. We may call all these cultural traditions carried in Persian or reflecting Persian inspiration, Persianate by extension. And that is, I'm using that by way of letting you know what the word Persianate means. The, he also uses the, the word Islamicate and ties the two together, whereas I would like to argue, as uh, his successors have in the, in the four decades that, uh, since he wrote his book, Venture of Islam in 1974, that really uh, the Persianate is less linked to the Islamicate uh, than uh, Hodgson imagined. And so uh, my travels over the sites of the production of Persian poetry lead me to believe that it's a truly multi-ethnic, uh, cosmopolitan, transnational as Jahan mentioned poetic tradition that is not the property of a single people, such as Iranians today, who claim it as their own. Uh, and it really reflects all of that. There are Buddhists who contributed to Persian poetry, there are Hindus who contributed to Persian poetry, and all kinds of people. And as you see, the geography is vast. But the way it happened was goes to the facing off of uh, a great cultural basin called Khorasan, that is northeastern Iran, uh, comprising of Afghanistan and Tajikistan, and much more in Central Asia, with Baghdad, which was at that time the center of an, an expanding Islamic empire. Uh, that's where Persian was fostered, patronized and begun really with in the courts of the area. Uh, about a century or so later, this tradition uh, began importing into itself a number of Gnostic ideas, mysticism. Of course, we have Christian mysticism, we have Jewish mysticism, we also have Islamic mysticism, which is often referred to as Sufism. And it's, it's a Gnostic vision, by and large, in which, which conceptualizes the relationship between man and God different from Islamic orthodoxy. Whereas Islamic orthodoxy, true to its roots in Judaism and Christianity, imagines a God that is total, omnipotent, omnipresent, and all of that, the mystics imagined, began to imagine at least, a beloved. Someone with whom human beings fall in love. And whom they serve willingly, eagerly, rather than as a way of storing something for their afterlife. So that, when that 
tradition and that kind of poetry begins to go southward and westward into the Iranian plateau, it meets all old, old, old manners of uh, ethnicity and religious orientation, and it begins to grow there in that geography. Now, this is not to say that Persian was the sole or even the main language of the Indian subcontinent, for example, or anywhere else. That's why Persian came to an end in India, for example, after a thousand years, because it entered into competition with the language of the street and the marketplace and so on and so forth. It remained a language, the language of the elite. It has always been an elitist art, uh, despite the efforts of some contemporaries to popularize poetry or to make poetry penetrate into the lower classes of any society. So what I have here is the site of the production of Persian poetry. It began to dominate not only the Indian subcontinent here, but and not only the Iranian uh, plateau, Afghanistan and Tajikistan and much of Central Asia, the two famed cities of Samarkand and Bukhara, for example, but it also went west because there was no other Islamic literary tradition that could compete with it. And as such, even the Ottomans began writing poetry in Persian until the rise of nationalism in the area. And it was that rise of nationalism which got everybody to think that they needed to have their own national language and national literature, if you will. So given that geography, I want to uh, walk you through some history. As you see, in my part one, the worldly strain, 10th through 11th centuries, in my handout, page one of my handout, you see two poems. One is by Rudeki, a late 9th, early 10th century poet from Samarkand, Central Asia, and the other by a poet who came two generations later, Manu Chehri of Dahan, which is also in Khorasan, but all of this is happening in, nor in the northeastern part of what's today Iraq. This poetry is worldly. It celebrates human beings. It's full of, it's full of uh, Carpe Diem and uh, Ubisunt and all kinds of sentiments. It acknowledges death. It deals with the time we have on this, on this planet, but it also cherishes the moment. If you notice, the second poem, for example, deals with wine and wine serving and wine culture and all kinds of things. And this is in an Islamic, Islamic environment, but never mind. <laughs> uh, so, let me read the opening lines of each of the two poems. Rudaki says, live joyfully with black-eyed beauties, live joyfully. The world is no more than legends in the wind. Shadzi basyakh chashman shad ke jahanni juz fesane bobad. Strong statement. Uh, and it, 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 it elaborates in the rest of the poem. It's a ghazal, by the way, and many of my poems are ghazals because it's good little, little short poem. Uh, Jahan talks about ghazal uh, in, in some of his work. And so it's, it's a kind of um, lyrical utterance of sorts. Uh, and because the nature of Persian poetry is such that it does not have gender designation, there is no he and she, there's only a, one, a single third person singular. As such, initially, this poem can be addressed to two entities. The poet is also often a man, and therefore may be in love with a woman, or another man, and it, it, it has a beloved lover position. It also is patronized by the court and is panegyric by nature, by and large. And so it praises the king. Later on, two centuries later, when these Gnostic idea, ideas begin to uh, come into this poetic tradition, a third entity enters, and that's God as beloved. So human beings are also lovers of God. 
which really introduces a very different vision than the orthodoxy, than the, the one that orthodoxy uh, privileges. Because, first of all, the Islamic mystics, the Sufis, did not think that they would go under the earth and they have to wait for thousands of years until the day of judgment when they are resurrected. No such thing. Immediately upon that, there's union, or at least audience, with God. And so it, re it begins to resemble a love story of an initial union that happened in the Garden of Eden before Adam and Eve were expelled. A long, history-long uh, period of separation and the hope or the imaginary of a you of union uh, upon death. So almost all mystics, and you see this most clearly, most, most pronouncedly in Rumi, believe that as soon as they die, they are going to get to uh, the presence of God, which is, is anathema to, to, the, to, the, to the Orthodox Muslims, because they believe there's, there has to be an accounting of, of, of good and bad deeds, and of course, you know, there are angels on my right shoulder and my left shoulder, and uh, the right shoulder recording all my good deeds has not, got nothing to do, the one left is very busy uh, <laughs> committing all my sins to writing, and, and, and I have to respond for those. As such, this poetry is postured mostly in opposition to two kinds of powers. In the beginning, it's a religious power structure, and more in, in more modern times, it also begins to preserve that posture and extend it to worldly powers as well. So though that's one strain in prayer. It's worldly. It, it tells you about the social structure. These are aristocrats gathered in a wine drinking, and wine drinking does not just mean getting drunk. It, 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 it reveals a whole culture. Uh, and it, it begins to propagate uh, resistance or even rebellion against all manner of uh, impositions from religious leaders. Beginning with the 12th century, and beginning with my second example, the Gnostic strain is visible. And the thing that drives this tradition forward is a process of wholesale interiorization. That's my word for saying all of the external assets of poetry begin to, to, go, to become inward. It's almost as if the public square moves into a little apartment and it becomes hidden from view. Everything that, for example, there's this wonderful, uh, wonderful holy grail type cup that is called Jame Jam. It's, it's, it's attributed to uh, Jamshid, the legendary king of Iran, into which you can look and you can see the world and goings on. It's much more a, 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 a device for augury, for auguring futures and so, and so on and so forth. But the Gnostics, beginning with Sanai, the poet of my second example, relate that to the human heart. Listen to this. You will hear many tales about Jamshid's cup. I'm reading from number two. And in each telling, something is added or left out. Know this for certain. Jamshid's cup is your heart. The seat of joy and sorrow is your heart. When you desire to view the world, you can see all things inside it. So there's that, that, that transposition of the cup into the heart produces all kinds of mirror-like surfaces. And it's in one such mirror-like surface where those birds, the 30 that have survived in, 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 in uh, uh, Mantabote, in the, the, the conference of the birds, eventually when they reach off, now, some people believe it, it must have been a tarn, a mountain-type mountain lake into which you so see their image, Others think it's a vertical thing, and they see it in uh, shiny, shining marbles of Mount Bath. Whatever it is, it's a reflection of themselves. Whereas a century or so before them, Ferdowsi had, hired, had, had used a simor, a bird, 
that is really a bird. It really, it really flies. It's also a healer and a seer. And all, it has all kinds of supernatural power, but it talks to human beings, it raises dust when it lands, and so on and so forth. But Atar Seymour is not a creature, it's a presence. It's a reflection of us. And this, this process of interiorization makes all kinds of poetic innovation very possible. I have uh, followed this trend, trend from Sanai all the way to Hafez three centuries later. And with Hafez, it becomes so inclusive that it even overtakes all the tales. In other words, the narrative is subsumed into the lyrical discourse. I call this emotive distillation. All the narratives of this, not all of them, many narratives of the Shahnameh are mentioned but are not treated as narratives. They relate to human emotions. L listen to this one. In Persian, Shah Turkan Sukhan Muddayan Mishinabad, Shahmi as Mazrami Khune Siavu Sheshba. Now, Shah Turkan, king of the Turks, it can refer to Afrasia, the Turanian king of the Shahnameh, who was an enemy of Iran, and so on and so forth. And his brother, Garcibaz, who was jealous of this Iranian prince who, having uh, problems with fighting, as heroes have to, he deserts his own land of Iran and goes into Turan and takes refuge there and displays all manner of warlike games but refuses to to fight in real wars. And so this king's brother becomes jealous of him, uh, starts badmouthing him with Afrasia, and eventually he's beheaded. And of course, when he's beheaded, when I was in, in Samarkand, someone took me to a wall with a hole and said, this is where Siavash was beheaded. <laughs> and it's that kind of a very precise locating of the sites of these legends. In, in, in the imagination that, that drives the mythology forward. So because of that, Hafez uses that as his beloved. The Turks were of course considered beautiful, and Shah Turkan in this case can also mean my beloved, my Shirazi beloved, from my city of Shiraz. And she listens to my rivals, my competitors, shame on her. So the same shame is transferred from a whole narrative, which good readers of Persian poetry keep in, their, in the back of their minds when reading this. And as such, you see all kinds of uh, ways of moving things inward and making this inward world that is a reflection built on the foundation of the outer world, but it's a much more pleasant one. Now, notice, to, notice this ghazal by Hafez, uh, which is my, again, part of, part of number two, the Gnostic strain. Uh, On the day of Azal, rays of your beauty broke forth. Love emerged and set the world afire. Now, Azal means pre-eternity. And pre-eternity is a day of creation. According to the Quran, God made a mass of clay, which included you and me and all human beings. But before breathing his own breath into this mass of clay, he made them pledge something. Am I not your Lord, he asked. Qalu bala. They said, yes, you are. And from that moment on, we all have pledged our allegiance to God, personally, singly, as well as as a mass of clay. Now, this, this becomes an occasion for thousands of ghazals and ghasidas in, this, in the Gnostic strain. But as you see, this one is very eventful, action-packed, really, in ways. Uh, all kinds of things are happening in these lines. I won't take the time to read it to you, but read it and, and forget about my bad translations, but try to guess at the poem, at, at, at what he might have meant. Uh, for centuries, this kind of strain travels all the way to India, uh, to 
what's today Pakistan, Lahore is one of the busiest sites of uh, poetic production in Persian. Dakan in uh, southern India, Lucknow, Calcutta, all of these cities that are written on outside of the map, uh, but point to uh, places in the map, approximate places, uh, become huge signs of poetic production. That's where Persian begins its uh, centuries-long conversation with Indian languages, most importantly Urdu. Previously, of course, Persian had borrowed a lot of Quranic and Arabic assets from Arabic to build its own, its own furniture, its own uh, instruments of poetic expression. Now it's time to give for Persian, and it gives to so many Indian languages. After centuries, for example, Urdu, which begins as a military language, is equipped enough to now become a poetic language. And of course, the British are now in India, 18th century, 19th century, and the struggle for nationalism has started. And so many poets, beginning with Beedle, and later with Ghalib, and finally with Iqbal of Lahore, uh, have divans in both languages, in Persian and Urdu. To the northeast, a similar rival rivalry is happening between Persian and Chagatai. Chagatai is the mother language of uh, modern Uzbek, the language of Uzbekistan and much more in Central Asia. In this one, in this, in this one it's a professor called Jami, the 15th century Persian poet, who gives all of this, this knowledge of Persian poetry to his pupil, Navai, Ali Shir Navai. Navai later moves on to Central Asia and also writes a divan in the newly poeticized language of Chagatai. He also leaves a, a, a Persian divan uh, for us, but he calls, he gives his own pen he, himself, the pen name of Fani, which means ephemeral which means not lasting. He does not think that his Persian poetry is much good. He is trying to initiate a new poetic language. So these, these languages in conversation are tremendously important. Another 15th century poet, Fuzuli of Caucasus, he was born in Baghdad and he lived his life in Tabriz and, and, and what's today uh, the Republic of Azerbaijan and, and uh, uh, Georgia and so on and so forth, it's, uh, he has three divans in Arabic, in Persian, and in Azeri Turkish. So the three co-minglings of Persian with these languages gives us so much Persian poetry, so much, and so much uh, offsprings of Persian poetry in Urdu, in various Turkic languages of Eastern, east of Iran and the Azeri Turkish and, and finally in the Ottoman Empire. The Ottomans, during a time beginning with 16th century, when we, we see three empires, the Ottoman Empire, the Mughal Empire in India, and in between the Persian Empire, the Safavid Empire. Politically, the Safavids are the weakest of the three, but culturally, they dominate. And it's Persian poetry that a continues to be written in India as well as in Ottoman, uh, in, in Ottoman territories, all the way to Sarajevo. Sarajevo is the easternmost site where we have identified production of Persian poetry. A book called Bulbulistan, which means a garden of nightingales, uh, is written in imitation of 13th century poet Sadi's Gul Gulistan, uh, the Rose Garden. So this poetry is very hegemonic. It's extremely hegemonic, and it does not retreat easily. It does in the 19th century, 19th and 20th century, in all of these territories. The British, of course, are in India. At one point, 1832, the Translation Act is passed in the British Parliament, and uh, the British government, the crown that has now uh, in, that is now in possession 
of all of the East India Company assets, refuses to support Persian as, uh, and Persian Munshis and so on and so forth in India and as such Urdu is elevated to the official language of British India, uh, India outside, of, outside of English. And of course Persian is also in these centuries in competition with English, that new and assertive imperial language. Previously it was, with it was in competition with Chinese uh, Chinese, lang Chinese language, and it, 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 today we see traces of Persian in uh, Western China as well, in Xinjiang, uh, which means new territories. So, it, this, is, this is what makes of Persian a national language. These days only in Iran, Afghanistan and Tajikistan, although Tajikistan also has a, a, a problem of writing in the Cyrillics and not in the Perso-Arabic uh, script. So my number three, two ghazals, I have beginnings of modernization in Persian poetry. And notice that there's the, a tradition of intertextual relationship, which I think is much more precise, much better defined than the term intertextuality. Because intertextuality tells, tells us there's a relationship between this, te this text and it and a predecessor, but it doesn't tell us what kind of a relationship. Whereas in these things you have a number, a whole vocabulary of am I responding to a previous poet? Am I facing up to him? Or am I facing him down? Am I, am I following him with the intention of learning his ways? Or am I following in a predatory way? So all kinds of, a whole variety of relationships between a, 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 an ancestor and a modern poet is, is, is imagined. Notice this first one. Again, it's the continuation and maybe even the beginning of the demise of the Gnostic vision in Persian poetry. And it's by a grandson of Fath Ali Shah who reigned Iran in, uh, in Iran in, 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 in the 19th century. And he begins with this usual uh, quest of the mystic to become a pure, a pure mystic and therefore, therefore develop a heart of gold and so on and so forth. گرم چا هست اندر راه تو یا دا یا هر دو و اگر سر می روید بر باد یا دستار یا هر دو زبانم یار می گوید روانم یار می جوید تو خواهی مست یا دیوانه هم پندار یا هر دو It's a, the typical opening of someone telling us about the quest and that quest in itself puts him through so much suffering that in the end he comes out with a shining heart. And it's from that position that he begins to dispense advice. A lot of Westerners who in the tradition of Orientalism have come to this notion of, uh, notion of uh, uh, the Ghazal, they don't quite understand the hidden uh, cohes cohesiveness of a Ghazal. They think, why is, why is it that it's talking about love and then all of a sudden begins advice? It is because the, in the poem itself, our narrator, our speaker, has been elevated into the position of moral superiority from which he can then advise us. Now notice the same a poem in the same meter. The meter may not be reflected in English, but in the same rhyme, that is, this or that or both. This or that or both. If you, if you look at both poems, uh, in number three, you'll see that the, the rhyme uh, keeps repeating that. But this time, a, a, a successor poet from the same city of Kermanshah is not on a mystical quest. He is on a quest to identify the traitors, those people who have laid Iran low, those people who have committed treason against their country. And notice that beginning word, Vatan. Is the homeland devastated? by the citizens or foreigners or both? Has this calamity been caused by Muslims or infidels or both? Everybody cries out love of the homeland, yet I know not whether love of the homeland consists in speech or action or both. Vatan Iran az yar ast, ya aghyar, ya har do. Musibat az musalman haast, ya kuffar, ya har do. Hame daad vatan khahi zananda ma nemi daram vatan khahi be guftar ast, your kirdar, your hardo. A barrage of questions. Who has done this? Who has done 
done done done this uh, committed committed this sin uh, this treason against this glorious empire of all times, and that is the beginning of patriotic nationalism. We need to guard this country. So almost all major poetic traditions have at one point been transnational. It is this nationalism that begins in Europe in the Renaissance and then comes to the Persian Arabic area in, in the 19th and 20th century that gives us the notion of one country, one language. There is no such thing. Persian is still an international language. But of course, you know, there's a claim, uh, and, and Afghans and Iranians have of, or forever been fighting for over centuries, who is the real proprietor of, of, of per this glorious lang poetic language of Persia. I do want to say something just to uh, have met the requirement of my beyond, because I say uh, uh, the, 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 the per Persian poetry, the Persian world and beyond. There's much translation of Persian poetry beginning with the biblical studies that leads into Orientalism in the 17th and 18th centuries. And it begins in Calcutta, which is the imperial capital in India. And it's there that, first, that the first Asiatic society gets established in uh, 1691, as a matter of fact, with the, with the founding of Calcutta. And later, a century later, William Jones, Sir William Jones, that wonderful, wonderful scholar, starts, notice the verb, Englishing Persian poetry. Today, of course, a lot of scholars, a lot of scholars see that as the beginning of that Orientalism which Edward Said has told us about. But I don't think it's quite that. I think much of what Edward Said has said, he himself has retracted or has been modified in, through the decades. Uh, it was not like saying Persians and Arabs are inferior and therefore we need to domesticate the language. No, it's a genuine, it follows a genuine 18th century theory of translation that John Dryden tells us first. And Alexander Pope tells us about it. And all of these. And by the time it gets to him, he, because he's the first generation and he's the dean of Orientalists, uh, the name have, they have given him, and he is telling us about uh, Persian poetry and its beauties through making it in, into real good English. And I recommend that you read one ghazal of Hafiz that he has translated. It's called a Persian so The Persian Song of Hafiz. Uh, and it's all over on, on, uh, on the internet. So find it and read it and let me know what you think about it. And for a century or so, this, this goes on. Edward Fitzgerald gave, gives us the uh, Rubaiyat, which turns a real scientist, my God, the chairman of the Department of Math Mathematics at the at Neishabur University into a poet. Khayyam was never a poet. Everybody dabbled in poetry. Everybody wrote poetry on the way walking to the office or back home. And that's what he did too. And then, it, the, the, because it was a four-line thing, more, much resembling psycho, uh, the haiku without having all those uh, syllable and rhyme restrictions and so on and so forth, everybody contributed to it. And later on, everybody who wanted to, to speak uh, something that, that was really you know, problematic, uh, wrote a rabbi and, and said, well, chayyams. So it's become a, dep a, 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 depository of, uh, a, a repository of all kinds of uh, infidelity expressed as poetry. Uh, and of course, later, there's the, the, a tradition of scholarship that comes to the fore. Uh, R.A. Nicholson translates the whole of uh, Rumi's Masnavi, the, the spiritual couplets, and, and writes a great commentary com that one that has been admired.